you have four kids. Some of you learn when you become a dad. The vacations are for the kids, and it's a trip for you. And I'm out of the house, and uh, it's, it feels good to not be in a car driving 500 miles each way. Uh, thank y'all for having me. Uh, I'll just real quickly just remember some moments in your prayers for our governor. He's in the hospital right now. He had some severe burns. Uh, he's doing well. And also, there was another shooting today. Uh, three more officers. Michigan, and uh, we live, really live in some crazy times, um, and so we keep all those, those folks in your prayers, um, but thank y'all for having me, and thank y'all for your dedication to the conservative cause, and uh, holding people's feet to the fires when it comes to um, what they say they're going to do, and what they get up in either in D.C. and Austin, and do or don't do, but uh, when Mrs. Um, Horn asked me to come speak, it was, it was about a month ago or so, and it was actually an interesting time, because the state the state gets sued quite a bit. We, we sue quite a bit as well. Our attorney generals, we, no state sues the federal government more than Texas, and no state wins more than, than Greg Abbott and, and Ken Paxton. They really don't like us in Washington. Um, so, the uh, but we can get sued as well. And uh, I'm on appropriations, and so I'm kind of a budget guy when it comes to uh, some of the policy, and it's kind of my wheelhouse in, in Austin. And uh, so I've been following these uh, five lawsuits. Uh, one of them started 21 years ago. One of them started about 11 years ago. One of them started five years ago. And uh, the last two have probably been the last two or two to three years. Uh, so it shows you how quick or how slow uh, the civil justice system works. Yes. But uh, to give you a little bit of background, when uh, we adjourned last session, the state of Texas, in my opinion, and, and it's in the governor's opinion and the speaker of the house opinion and the Lieutenant Governor, we passed the most conservative budget in the history of the state of Texas. And what I mean by that is a group of 14 very conservative groups came together and they said that if Texas spends more than 6.5% above the previous budget, which is population growth and inflation, then they're just like Washington, D.C. 6.6 .6 wouldn't do it, 6.5 was the number. Texas came in at 5.7%. So that's $1.5 billion of your taxpayer money that was left in a checking account that could have been spent and still been conservative. Now, when we left Austin, we had about, I'd say close to $7 billion in our checking account. Um, and that's, because we have, this is projected, and uh, we have, uh, this is all projected from the comptroller, and we have spending limits, so $7 billion in the checking account, $11 billion in the rainy day fund. So we're getting close to $20 billion, our budget's 212, so Texas was looking very, very good at the uh, end of the 84th legislative session. Well, then oil prices, they weren't going anywhere. They weren't going up. And so that's one of the reasons we did that. You know, uh, we, we didn't spend everything there because it may not be there. And we had lawsuits out there that we knew we, we may have to defend and, and actually pay out. So uh, Comptroller Hager's come back recently and actually moved that number down to $4.1 billion. So we still have $4.1 billion in excess funds going in that session. That's top of the $11 billion in the rainy day fund, which is actually probably gone by now. So basically what we need is um, we need 56.52 a barrel, is what the comptroller says, to come in at that $4.1 billion. Right now we're at 46.76. So we're there. I mean, we're getting very close to being there. And I can tell you in 1980s, I come from a real estate family. I remember the bus in the 1980s. We were 32% dependent upon the price of crude. Now we're 14% dependent on the price of crude. We're much more diversified. Texas is strong. We're going into 2017 looking great. We're one of the few AAA bonded, uh, rated bonded uh, states left in the country. Um, you know, we look at California, that's probably junk bond status. I would, I'd rather buy a stick of gum than buy anything that's, you know, the state of California sells these days. Michael Troncali just dropped his daughter off here. I talked to him today. He said, California is just Texas if it were blue. He said, it is absolutely phenomenal what that state has done to itself. And so uh, we're the last bastion, really, of uh, large states' conservatism left in this country. Um, so to go through the quick lawsuits, because three of the five have already been decided since we last spoke, um, which is one I last spoke. The first was school finance lawsuit. <coughs> the state gets sued about every 10 years because we don't fund public education adequately. Okay, so let me just give you a little background. Uh, I'm, on the, I'm on the appropriation committee, and I'm on the subcommittee for education. All right. Okay. Forty-two percent of the budget.
goes through that article. Seven people in the House and three people in the Senate decide 42% of the budget. We spend 42% of our taxpayer money on education. It's the number one expenditure. I don't know what else. You know, your own budget at home is a reflection of your priorities. Education is a priority in Texas, and we show it through our pocketbooks. I don't see how spending more money on it is going to fix it. The Supreme Court came back 9-0 and said, the Texas system is not perfect. If they, don't, they didn't particularly like the Robin Hood system. Uh, they don't like some of the funding formulas between rural and urban, but we're not going to throw it out and make them rewrite the school finance. So they, they found in favor of the state. That would have been a very, very expensive lawsuit had we lost it. Then there's a sales tax suit, and this is an interesting one. I thought we were going to lose it. Um, it was an oil and gas, uh, Southwest Royalties filed a suit uh, back in the mid-90s, and they said when they drill in the earth, and they pull out hydrocarbons, and they separate it from uh, natural gas and then con uh, or, you know, crude condensate, that they are actually manufacturing a product. And that their drill bits and their pipes should be tax exempt. And they're fracking the chemicals, and everything they say do within their business should be tax exempt. So we've been doing a little bit of drilling over the last five years. That, that lawsuit would have been $4.4 billion, including a $500 million deficit going forward. So we won that 9-0. But I'm telling you, if you listen to the arguments of the Supreme Court Justice, you would have thought we were going down in flames. And uh, Comptroller Hager's office did an excellent job defending the state, saying that the legislature should decide these issues, not the Supreme Court, a bunch of attorneys you know, who, don't, who don't run back home in the 150 districts in the House and 31 in the Senate. And, that, and the, same, the, same, the same thing will affect the next lawsuit I'm talking about. There's winners and losers when you start playing with definitions in the Supreme Court, and you don't know how this is going to affect people going back five years. So we won that. The next one's a franchise tax lawsuit. This has not been decided yet. Uh, the, uh, there's a movie theater chain out of California, AMC. They operate here in Southeast Texas. And they want to change the definition of overhead and what they should be able to deduct from their gross sales. Well, uh, this, this has been about a 10-year ten ten lawsuit. I feel very, I feel confident that Texas is going to win this, but this is six billion dollars and 1.5 billion dollars going forward. So we're talking big time money here, okay? I about that. I think we're going to win that. Um, no, don't don't hold me to that. Uh, the third, uh, fourth lawsuit that Texas did win. Um, this is this is actually very important if you're a veteran here in, in, this, in this room. Texas has the Hazelwood Act. Are you familiar with the Hazelwood Act? Yes. So basically in Texas, we decided years ago to pass the Hazelwood Act, and we will pay for, Texas taxpayers will pay for 140 hours of in-state public tuition for any veteran in the state of Texas. And then we had passed the Legacy Act in 2011 that said any of your children can use that 140 hours. And you can divvy it up. You can give 40 hours to one child who you don't like and 100 to the one you do like. <laughs> and it can, be, it can be for medical school, it can be for anything. Graduate program, it does, it does not matter. Well, we don't like to make them study more. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is on top of the uh, GI Bill. So this wouldn't, this wouldn't, you could use both of them. Well, Texas universities were fine with it. You know, realize that we, we owe a duty to our veterans and we will absorb this cost. Texas uh, pumps in about $50 million towards the Hazelwood Act. Well, one young man, in California, it's always California, um, he came in and said, well, I want to go to law school, and I'm going to go in Texas, because my dad's a veteran, and Texas is going to pay for it. And so he filed suit, and he found a federal judge who agreed with him, and his, he's never set foot in Texas, his dad never set foot in Texas, so there's, and he piggybacked on another lawsuit that had to do with in-state tuition. And so in, the in-state tuition lawsuit said that that universities cannot charge a, a veteran or a child of a veteran or a child of a service member out-of-state tuition because they move around so much and basically they all get in-state tuition. Well, this judge said, well, they also get the Hazelwood Act. So guess what other 49 states? Come to Texas and Texas taxpayers are going to pay for your children's education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that goes up to $500 million price tag if this, if this lawsuit were to stand. But just this past week, Supreme Court ruled and said that the Hazelwood Act is only for Texas residents. 
Big, it's a big, uh, that was a big win, no doubt about it. And the last lawsuit, it's actually a lawsuit out of court, and I think Texas deserved this lawsuit, and I think that we deserve to get beat in this respect. And it has to do, it's something that's near and dear to my heart because I've been involved in my wife as, a, as an attorney, and I have a lot of attorney. And this has to do with CPS and foster care in the state of Texas. We do a terrible job in the foster care system in Texas. And I'm looking, I'm talking to a room of pro-life individuals, and we deserve to treat children with the respect they deserve. And if we're going to be pro-life, then we need to make certain these children have a chance. And this foster care system doesn't do it. It doesn't cut it here in Texas. There's a lot of red tape. There's not enough money involved in it. Um, you, have, you have children with severe issues. They've seen things in their home that none of us want to talk about. They've seen their mothers be prostituted out. We've seen drug activity happen that no one wants to ever think happens in our communities, but it does. And we pay a foster care family $25 a day to watch that child. Who would take a child who was an act out in so many different ways for $25 a day? None of them do, except the ones that just do it for the money. And basically, is a de facto group home. And so we need, we need to really look at this issue. Uh, we've been sued in federal court, and we're going to lose this one. He appointed two special masters that have done this in other states, that have come to states and said, this is what's wrong with the prosecutor system. This is how you need to fix it. And there's a big heavy price tax. And we deserve this. We, we, we've neglected this issue for so many years. And if it weren't for people, and I know CPS case workers, it's, they're like, it's like a prison guard job. I mean, who wants to do that for 500 bucks a week before taxes? It's, it, the turnover is unbelievable. I had a hearing or a little meeting, open house in uh, Lumberton with Representative White. We, we met with 50 foster care parents. And that, these are the good ones. These are the ones who are doing it for the right reasons. They want to adopt these kids at the end of the day. And the stories they've got are terrible. And they're all, it's all legislative issues or it's federal issues. And we got to work through these things. And <coughs> this is going to be a big issue. Uh, and I've got a bill. I got a great bill. You can't tell anybody about it. <laughs> uh, someone more senior is going to steal this idea from me. Uh, I've actually told some people about it uh, who, who are interested parties, so it's already out there. But uh, it's a great, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute when I get to what I'm going to do next session. But um, that's something we really, it's a lawsuit that we deserve to lose. And uh, I'm kind of glad it happened because the legislative, any legislative body, I don't care where they are in this state or probably in this country, they're all reactive bodies. You have to tell them do something and sometimes it's, it's, it's a lawsuit hit them over the head to remind them they need to make certain change so I actually welcome the foster care debate uh, next year so uh, I'll go through some of the big topics of the 85th session which starts January 13th it ends May 29th it's the best process process in the country we have 140 days to get things done there's deadlines that start rolling in in early May the time frame is really a lot shorter than you think. We can't take up a bill the first 60 days per the Constitution unless it's an emergency item that only the governor can sign. So really, it's a short, short time frame because the urgency is awesome and makes people come together and figure out the solution because there will be another year and a half before you can even think about it again. And I've got a wife who says, if you're not home on May 29th, I'm changing the locks on the door. <laughs> so I've got to get things done or I will be sleeping in the streets. And a lot of people feel the same way. They got jobs to get back home to. They got family. I don't know how doctors and attorneys do this job. I mean, if you're not in the office making money, how do they how do they justify this? Uh, I bring this up all the time, but you, this isn't Congress. I mean, I made two dollars and sixty nine cents last month. You know, I'm not doing that. Doesn't pay for one diaper and two wipes. I mean, that's just <laughs> that's nothing. But you know, you do it because I can you find care a better deal than that. Exactly. <laughs> do it because you care about Texas. So the first thing we're going to do is. And it's a, this, is the, this is awesome. This happened last week, um, early last week. The governor, the Speaker of the House, and the Lieutenant Governor signed a, a, a letter to all the state agencies and all the bureaucrats saying we want a zero-based budget, which we hadn't done since 2003, and we want a 4% across-the-board reduction in every program. Now, mind you, the state is growing. People are moving here on a daily basis. Our expenses will be higher, but Let's, look where a four, let's see what a 4% reduction looks like. I mean, that, it can't hurt, right? And let me tell you, I, I, was, I was around in 2003, and Governor Perry asked for a zero-based budget. Agencies hate it. 
They absolutely hate a zero-based budget. What you have to do is, there's different columns in the budget. There's what's in the budget, and there's what's out of the budget, and there's what might be in the budget if there's ever money available, which is a wish list, and it makes you feel good because it never is ever going to happen. But in a zero-based budget, or in a traditional budget, you come in and you say, this is, a, this is everything we want. You can reduce it, this or that. This is how many FTEs, full-time employees. You know, we can play with that number. Basically, you assume that every expenditure in the state budget is justified, and it's more about tweaking it. Zero-based budget, everything's in the no column, and every agency has to go in there and justify movement from the no column to the yes column. And what ends up happening is a whole lot more stuff gets left in the no column, and a whole lot more FTEs get left in the no column. So it is, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work. I think with some agencies, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to, you're going to see some savings, and some others, maybe not. Uh, TPPF, which is a very conservative think tank in Austin, their recommendation is to do agencies a chunk at a time. Each session take 10 agencies or five agencies and do it because it's just too much work for 140 days to try to do a zero-based budget for all $212 billion. But we're going to do it anyway. So <laughs> uh, we're going we're to give it a shot. Um, you know, I thought there was actually an editorial from the Houston Chronicle uh, last June that said Republicans have ran out of pro-life issues. They've done everything they can possibly do. Which, in my opinion, as long as there's an abortion happening in the state of Texas, we haven't done everything we can do. So, the curious thing happened about 10 days ago. The Supreme Court threw out House Bill 2. And Wendy Davis said, you know, we may have lost some battles, but we just won the war. She needs to get out of calculator and start learning how to count. Because uh, the second... We're going to have as, as many members, if not more, in the Republican Party back in 2017 that we did in 2013. And House Bill 2 was just an omnibus House Bill. The Supreme Court overstepped their boundaries, surprise, surprise, and threw out the whole bill. Well, it was a, it was a laundry list of, of items. And they threw it out based on, on access to church, the surgical hospitals and an admitting practices of doctors. But there was a bunch of other stuff in that bill that we're coming back at, that they never addressed in their opinion. So we're going to have another, we're going to have another pro-life session in 2017. And the bills are being drafted. And we'll just dust, dust off House Bill 2 and, and rework it. I know there was um, one version of House Bill 2 that actually had an opt-out for rural counties who were within, they said, oh, if you're 200 miles from a, from a surgical hospital, that's an undue burden on, on, on a female trying to there's an opt-out. Well, if you're within so many miles, then, then you can opt-down. It's not perfect, but it gets it gets the majority of House Bill 2 in there. So we're coming back. Um, I, I, I wouldn't think, I would have thought, I really thought we were going to win House Bill 2. Uh, but uh, it was the most conservative, stringent abortion bill that's ever been tried in, since Roe v. Wade. So, um, you know, our Supreme Court, they are what they are. Um, and that's another, that's a discussion for Jeff. Um, uh, the governor talked about internet. Uh, this is kind of—it's not that—it's not the you know the funnest topic, but I think it's something that really would drive down the cost of education, both uh, in public schools and higher education. And that's internet connectivity. Believe it or not, we have a bunch of counties in the state that do not have any form of high-speed internet, and they can't access all this online education that really drives down the cost of education. You know the number one. The number one provider of MBA programs in education in the United States of America? Phoenix University. Lamar University. Lamar. Lamar yeah. University. Yeah. I spoke at their graduation uh, last year. They had 900 MBA graduates and 10 doctoral graduates. I asked them to raise their hand if they've ever, if they've ever, if they've never stepped foot on Lamar campus. 80% of them raised their hand. Hmm. Some of them never stepped foot in the state of Texas. They got their MBA from the Marty University. They did it completely online. So the governor, I guarantee you, I don't know what his emergency <laughs> topics are going to be for the first session, but I think that's going to be one of them. We need to get broadband access throughout the rural Texas and start driving on the cost of education. I think it's going to be a boondoggle for the Marty University, at least I hope it is. Um, mental health reform has been, has been uh, it's a huge topic. I wouldn't be surprised if the governor add, uh, added mental health reform to the uh, emergency items. I think this is not really a, a state issue. I think this is a local issue. Uh, I've been meeting with 
the um, Baptist hospitals and the sheriff's department and uh, the police department too. Luckily, we have a little group we've been getting together. Uh, the Meadows Foundation out of Dallas has, has uh, offered to put money in, their own money into this program. Uh, Gift of Life, uh, Regina Rogers, some of those groups to try to figure out a way to, when, we, when someone shows up at the ER or someone shows up at the county jail or the Beaumont jail, uh, city jail, that they, uh, they're they screened and we figure out what is their mental health issue and what can we do about it. Let's get them treatment now to where they're not on the streets, they don't do something like this gentleman did in Dallas or probably this gentleman did in Michigan. These are, I mean, you ask a cop, they know where these people, they know who these people are. They're repeat offenders. But after five or six years, they twist off and they do something really, really terrible. And um, this is also a CPS issue because a lot of these folks are, are young mothers with bipolar issues and they need professional treatment and we've kind of turned our back on them and I don't think the state can fix this I think each community has to get together and come up with their own group consortium to figure out what works in their area and so and you know there's a there's a statistic that's all, often quoted that you know we lose 20 veterans a day in the United States through suicide and you know we owe it to them to have a program to where they can don't have to go to the VA Texas needs to do it they don't need to go to the VA and wait six months to try to get some medication. You know, that we need to do, Texas needs to take care of, we've done a good job taking care of our veterans. We do, uh, every session, we, we've come up with a new way to, to honor them or to try to drive down their cost of living. And I think this, this mental health issue is another avenue to do that. Uh, next Tuesday, I have, we have our first hearing on war security. And we're gonna meet with DPS and we're gonna hear how it's going. Um, I can tell you, I've been very pleased. They've hit their goal of 250 new officers, new officers uh, on the border. And let me tell you, like I've said this after session, this is a border security bill, not an immigration bill. Yeah. Our hands are tied by our, our lovely federal government when it comes to immigration. This is border security. They have apprehended some drug cartel members that the federal government could never dream of getting. Why? Because I personally believe folks on the border trust the Department of Public Safety. They trust DPS. DPS is hiring from within their community, and they're saying they're giving intel to DPS. And they've actually made some great arrests. They've actually, I think they've done a good job with, and so we gave them $800 million. They've spent 71. Wow. Wow. They don't, I mean, which, we knew what would happen. The House had three hundred million in the budget. The Senate had eight hundred. The Senate won. But they, I think, at the end, at the end of the two years, they won't not, they won't break the hundred million dollar mark. And, and and a lot of that's upfront costs. Some of it's surveillance uh, airplanes or helicopters. Some of it's uh, cameras on the ground that have a, a good shelf life. And some of it's the upfront training of his DPS officers. So we have a lot of money left in that strategy. That I don't know what we're going to do with. We'll put it back in GR or use it a tax cut. I don't know, but. DPS doesn't seem to need it at this point. But we'll find out next Tuesday, really, um, the numbers they have. I can tell you that the members on the border, our Democratic friends on the border, want them gone as soon as tomorrow. Sure. But um, I think some of their voters do not. Um, you know, my dad's got a place to hunt down in Uvalde, and they love DPS. That makes their life a whole lot easier seeing that, that badge on that car. And they appreciate the presence of DPS. And, and you also noticed last week, the first of what, from my understanding, the first of many Border Patrol agents indictments for drug cartel activity are coming down. The first one was rolled out last week. These are these are these are federal employees who are actually involved in drug trafficking trade, um, and uh, you know they're on the take. This last one, I believe, was at a tire shop, and they had an informant come in and say, "This guy's making a little too much money." <laughs> this tire shop, yeah, I'm out. And so they they put some surveillance on them, it turns out that Border Patrol agents was actually involved in the trafficking of drugs um, down in the valley. So, but I, I, you know, border security, it's, it's going to happen. We're going to keep revisiting it until the federal government does something about it. So we'll be doing it until, you know, not long ago, probably. Uh, the Sunset Commission, uh, the Sunset Commission, if you don't know what it is, uh, every 10 to 12 years, and sometimes even less, every state agency has to go before Sunset. And basically what happens is you cease to exist as an agency unless a bill is passed to reauthorize you as an agency. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as a former staffer, I always thought it was kind of a, you know, 
it's often, you know, people like to say, oh, Sunset, yeah, we sunset all these committees. And then you work there and you see the same people, you know, we get rid of this agency and that person shows up the next session with a different agency. And you're like, Dude, how many FT, how many full-time employees <laughs> did we really cut? Are we just reshuffling chairs here, you know? But this year, we have a new chairman and he's got a better idea of what it, it's, it's basically a zero-based budget, but for Sunset. Everything in the Sunset bill is in the no column. And you gotta move it over to the yes column. Because what happens is everything is in the yes column and you fight over the nose and very little gets cut, just like the budget. So he, he's rethought the process that's never been done in Sunset's history. Sunset's been around for decades. We have some big ones. We have TxDOT, slightly large agency. Texas Medical Board, the State Bar, we have a lot of medical agency actually. And then um, we have the Weather Commissioner. And Commissioner, I'm a, presumed to be Commissioner elect Wayne Christian, who was here the other day. Uh, you know, I'm glad he won because he has experience and they're going through a very tough sunset process. Uh, Technology has changed, the, the Sunset Commission needs to change with it. Um, and their budget has been slashed quite a bit over years. Uh, interesting enough about his election, which I thought was awesome, is that, and I always say, you gotta really, really appreciate rural Texas. We keep things moving here. He's the first statewide candidate to ever win any election, primary or general, by lo despite losing the four largest counties in the state. Hmm. He lost big in the four largest counties, but cleaned up in rural Texas. And he won by a comfortable margin, but it wasn't because of the big boys. It was because he went around to the little guys and, and got the votes he needed to get. So kudos to him. Um, sanctuary cities is a little, it's a topic that, you know, leaving last session I thought was kind of a no-brainer. What we found is that the Senate had a hearing about six months ago, and they spent two hours trying to define what a sanctuary city was. No one could, no one could even agree what it even meant. And I've actually found, to my delight, that well, there's a list of, of cities in Texas who were sanctuary cities. Port Arthur was one of them. And I contacted two police officers, one I went to high school with, one I had no cash with. He said, what, we turn them over. I don't know what we're talking about. We don't have that policy. To where we get rid of, you know, we just shuffle them. Under. No, he's like, that's news to me. That's not an internal policy or written policy or spoken policy. So we're trying to figure out if you're a sanctuary city, what is that and how to penalize it, basically. My thought was, uh, and it was recent news, um, the 287G program. Okay, that's where a county, you know, a, 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 a county sheriff or a uh, police chief can contract with ICE to have a designated person within their office to make deportation decisions and to process. Because right now there's no, there's an interagency, you know, firewall between, you know, let's say Jefferson County Sheriff's and ICE. You know, who's going to be designated as, okay, this guy, and this, I mean, mind you, the critics of this program think that every person who gets pulled over for speeding who's an illegal immigrant gets deported. Although I would argue that if you're here illegally, you've, you know, now you've broken two crimes, um, you sped and you're here illegally, but, and maybe if you're here illegally, you shouldn't speed, you know, that may be a good idea too, but the, uh, why, do, why does not, why don't every department have a 287G officer? Why don't every single one of them in the state contract with the government to have that program, to have that dialogue with ICE? And you know, ICE will tell you that they really just deport the worst of the worst. It's the ten-time DWI offender. It's the aggravated sexual assault of a child offender. I mean, it's in the in Harris County. It's like in the hundreds. I mean, we're talking a county of millions upon millions of people. So it's you know, it's not. It's just a red herring to act like this is the, the sanctuary cities that we're just going to deport every illegal immigrant that's ever stepped foot on Texas soil. That's that's not what this program is about. But it's all this pushback even among a reasonable amount of people, but I, I gotta give it to the Harris County uh, Sheriff. Um, you know, he did renew that program a lot, uh, under a lot of pressure, and <coughs> he's running for re-election, and he took it like a man. And Ron Hankins is a good guy, former constable. So I, my question is why are we not all doing this program? And maybe that's how we get rid of the sanctuary cities, is that we have a designated person within each department who uh, keeps an eye on the ice hole. So um, transgender, transgender bathroom, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> You know exactly what that's all about and how, I mean, I, I can't 
Let's just go with the word stupid. <laughs> That's a good word. I'll, I'll use that. Yeah, 